Hey, ocean leaders. Welcome to the first episode of Ocean Talk. I'm your host, Angelou, and I'm very proud to present this sort of experimental uh, program that, I've, that I have going on here where we discuss uh, one ocean topic per week, whether it be an ocean issue or uh, an action item that we can do together. What I want to do is I want to integrate you into... Uh, discussing stuff about the ocean. Normally you come on Speak Up for Blue or you come on Speak Up for Blue TV, uh, our YouTube channel, and you watch me uh, discuss or one of our contributors or authors uh, or interns dis- you know, talk about ocean conservation through an article or a video. But eventually what I want this program to become is have guest people on, like yourself, and talk about ocean issues okay if you guys feel comfortable talking about ocean issues i also want you guys to suggest ocean issues that we have so there's two ways you can participate the first way is go on twitter and with the hashtag ocean talk all one word i want you to uh suggest an issue that you want to see us discuss okay uh and we'll we'll try and get to it as soon as possible of course if there's more than one issue that comes up or if, there, if an issue comes up more over and over and over again we'll probably take that we'll probably take precedent and we'll discuss that issue now, the second way to get involved, again, go on Twitter with the hashtag OceanTalk and say, I want to get involved in the discussion. Okay, And then what we'll try and do is we'll try and contact you and schedule a time where we can discuss uh, the issues uh, online, record it, and put it up on YouTube and embed it on, on Speak Up for Blue. So today, we, uh, we're going to pre-pick some topics. And I've got our, uh, our, our guest today is a Speak Up for Blue contributor, Rebecca Dolson. Rebecca, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Very good, very good. Uh, I want to thank you to you know for trying this experimental program that we have going on here. And the reason why Rebecca's on right now is not only does she provide great articles as a contributor, um, but she's uh, provided an article that we posted uh, just a couple days ago, if you're watching this recently or when it first posted up, uh, about the aquarium trade. Uh, the the public aquarium and zoos to be specific and sort of debate around issues involved in that uh, you know around the whole public issue so we're going to tackle three topics today um, and it's going to be a quick we're going to keep it to five to ten minute episodes so we're going to just you know say our opinions on it and then move on to the next to the next episode if you have you know the viewer if you guys have an opinion on what we're talking about just put it in the comments below so if you're on speak up for blue tv if you're watching this on youtube there's comments below feel free to add your your two cents uh into this and and we'll we'll try and get back and interact on the comments uh, and if you're on speakupforblue.com watching this, again, there's the comments are right there. Just interact as much as you want. Okay, so uh, we'll get started. You ready, Rebecca? Yep. Okay, but actually, before we get started, Rebecca, why don't you just uh, give people a little background? Uh, not only your Speak Up for Blue contributor, but uh, what, you know, what give you a background of who you are and uh, kind of what you do. Sure. So I am a fisheries biologist, and I work on a bunch of different issues, ranging from lake management and research on different. Uh, cold water species in the lakes in Ontario and I've also done some work on lemon sharks in the Bahamas and some leatherback sea turtles in Grenada but that was quite a few years ago now. That's great and you you stay with the marine world by through Speak Up for Blue and doing all your wonderful contributions. Great okay cool so let's get uh, started on the first on the first topic so I'm going to let you start on this first topic and the first topic is we're going to discuss our opinions on uh, I guess they're kind of. I guess they're considered aquariums, uh, such, as, such as Sea World and uh, in Canada, uh, where we're both from, uh, Marine Land. Uh, you know, what do you think? You know, what, what's your what's your opinion on how those sort of Sea World and Marine Land use marine mammals as you know in their shows to show us tricks and, and stuff like that? How do you show sort of the public tricks? How do you feel about that kind of thing? Um, so I, I didn't address this particular topic too much in the article, um, mainly because I I find this one a little more difficult. As far as I know, Marineland, um, just based on their website, does not offer a research or conservation, sorry, I'm going to lose a cat, Um, (laughs) does not offer a research or conservation aspect. They're solely, as I understand it, again, I could be wrong, for-profit, and the animals are basically exploited with very little contribution to a breeding program, um, although I do think they have tried to be involved with SeaWorld with some breeding programs, but um, very little way in giving back, in terms of giving back or benefiting um, the, the larger ocean community, aside from the fact that children and youth and, and 
everyone of all ages, I guess, are able to interact and maybe meet an animal or see an exotic species that they've never seen before and develop that connection. That's probably the only thing that they're really contributing, a bit of public awareness. Right. And I, I, I agree. I, there's, you know, the shows, you know, show how intelligent these animals really are. Right by doing the tricks that they do, and and you know apparently the the animals want to do these kind of tricks. I don't know if I believe that completely, um, but I believe some of the workers there, you know, really want to help the animals. Really, you know, form a bond with these animals. I mean, it's it's really difficult not to. I can't imagine people not doing that. Right? Maybe the upper brass or or whatever. But one thing I find kind of destroying. It's an example that I go back when I went to Marineland in in Niagara Falls, Ontario. Um, you know, one time I I, I brought uh, my girlfriend at the time, my wife now. We watched a show, and one of the one of the dolphins, one of those dolphins, came out of the gate too early, and it hit the gate. But somehow, nobody really saw how it hit the gate. But as it came out, there was blood coming out of out of the blowhole. And at first, you're like, you know, you don't really see it. You're like, well, it, what's going on with that animal? Like, it, it still swam properly and everything. Mm-hmm. But you can tell there was, after a while, the blood just kept coming out and coming out. And at one point, you know, they looked like, oh, they're addressing it. You know, the the, the veterinarian or a trainer came out, called the bottlenose dolphin over. Bottle, the dolphin came over, and he kind of splashed some water, kind of looked at the blowhole, made sure everything was fine. And then, you know, you'd think, okay, they're going to take them to the back. You know, and and look, take a closer look, and and bandage him up. But they actually made him go back and do his trick. You know, and in the show they addressed it, saying, you know, they really want to do this trick, so it's it, it's less stress on them to do this trick. But you know, as an audience member and, and a marine biologist, you're like, no, you should go look at his, you know, his 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 injury and or her injury. I forget if it was a male or female, but look at the injury first. Make sure the dolphin is safe first before you go do a show. What's more important, the health of the animal? Or the you know the 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 show, you know what I mean and 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 a lot of people at the in the audience were were distraught by it. They're like you know they should have looked after the dolphin. And I'm not a veterinarian, um, so I you know it's kind of hard to make a kind of hard to make a call. Like maybe it you know maybe the animal would be more stressed. But you know if my kid was hurt, you know mm-hmm. if this was my child and my my daughter was hurt, but she wanted to still play in the park, but she's bleeding profusely, I'm not going to let her go play back in the park, even if she cries, even if she's stressed. I'm going to make sure she's, you know, you know, she's better. You know, I'm going to bandage her up and make sure she's safe. And that's how I felt that the dolphin should have been treated. And so that, like, with st- things like Marineland, now, now SeaWorld, I've never seen that happen at SeaWorld, but with Marineland, it gets even, you know, the, like you said, the articles that have come out with Marineland with the, the degraded water quality or potential. And, and now uh, I remember uh, we discussed there's a potential article where there's mass graves on the on the land, potentially, like on the marine, on the park land. I mean that's you know that's not what this should be all about. It should be about education and and things like that. And I think with the for profit aspect, it gets a little touchy at times. I would definitely agree with that. And I mean, the the people who regulate the zoos and aquariums, I know I think it was in 2012. They they did recertify, or I I don't know if it's a an audit. Right. But Marineland did pass, so I right. don't know what I'm not up on the standards and what's required, but. Yeah. They did pass, but whether or not um, is that a spot visit? Are there yeah. many many visits before they get a check or yes or no? Yeah. I, I don't know those like what's involved in the process, but it definitely seems as though no one was checking the day you were there. Yeah, I mean, it could be one of those things where they checked that day and they were just prepared for it, and they said, "Well, everything's better now," you know. And it, and it could be one of those things like um, you know, a year ago, Marineland had that problem where somebody came out that used to work there quit used to work there said you know the water quality was degraded and it happens sometimes and they they get it back to normal and then mm-hmm. the animals get better but this time it wasn't getting back to normal they weren't addressing it and then that's where this whole spot mm-hmm. visit came from i think it was the humane society was it not um not sure to yeah me. i think it was it was something like the humane society and so when they went back in you know they were prepared for it and they were like well everything's fine mm-hmm. so everything looks fine so it's it's not to say that they're they're bad but it's not to say that they're good either because there's been a lot of sp- – it's not just this one-time thing. This has happened yeah. over and over and over again. So you kind of wonder what's happening. Now, SeaWorld, on the other hand, they have you know they have a rescue program. Yes, they do. So right. they offer um, – I believe it's mainly marine mammals that they right. assist with. If you go on their SeaWorld's website, they have a list of the animals that they've helped right. over the right. years. Um I don't seem to think it's 
is as extensive as some of the other, for example, Moult Marine Laboratory in Florida, which is a, a nonprofit education research science facility with a lot of great outreach. They have a sort of marine hospital, and the only animals that remain there are ones that can't be reintroduced into the wild. And I'm not sure it's on that level at all. Right. Yeah. I could be wrong, but I it seems like it's a much smaller com- component. But again, they do at least offer the rehab yeah. program. And then looking on the, I'm always looking at the negative side, but looking at the negative side is what constitutes not being able to go back in into the wild? Is there is there specific criteria, you know, that they work with? Because you could, you could make the argument that, okay, well, yeah, this guy could go back, but, you know, we could make more money by having somebody come see him. Yeah, and make him jump through hoops. I'm, I'm not sure for SeaWorld. I know Moat Marine Lab, they think they have to be pretty injured. Um, that really famous dolphin, was it Winter? Maybe, yeah. I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, Winter's Tail? I think. The oh, one, right, right, right. Yep. Was it Moat Marine Lab? So I think they okay. actually made a, it, it was a dolphin that I, I could be wrong, but believe it lost part of its tail and they made a prosthesis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that was the whole, and it, it actually, it was the whole training. It was all about the training of how it. Yeah. started using it yeah so there are i mean there are some, there are a lot of rescue centers out there mm-hmm. and i think you know the whole issue is okay if you're a not-for-profit rescue center maybe it's there's you get a little more credibility because you're not trying to make money and people see trying to make money as right. sort of a negative thing um and i guess that's the way i'm looking at it as a, to a certain degree but there are some good things and i'm sure people at SeaWorld have saved a lot of animals um and and for the good right and some go back and some don't Maybe they can't be reintroduced. Mm-hmm. I don't want to badmouth SeaWorld. One, I don't want to get sued, but I don't yeah. want to badmouth SeaWorld. But it's, it's a question that people have. Um, but if you guys have opinions, the, the audience, if you guys have opinions, put it, put them in the comments. What do you think? Do you think SeaWorld and places like Marineland uh, that are for-profit agencies um, or businesses, do you think they actually should be um, allowed to rescue animals or allowed to be put on these displays, or should they be held to a certain criteria? Um, we're healthy, like with the health of the animals. Let us know in the comments below. Let's go on to the next one because um, we could probably go on forever. But let's look at, at the ethics of holding large, uh, f- you know, say let's look at aquariums and, and zoos, large fish uh, and, and marine mammals. You know, that's that tends to be uh, uh, an area of controversy uh, where you have, you know, keeping like a, a, the Georgia Aquarium, for instance, you mentioned in, in your article, you know they they hold how many how many whale sharks? They have four whale sharks in a six point three million gallon tank. Right, massive tank. I've seen. I haven't been to the Georgia Aquarium, but massive tank. I mean, it just it stretches huge. Like I mean, I, I've seen people it's take. Intense. Yeah, it's intense. people take pictures and they're like the people look like this big compared to the whole you know the whole aquarium and, and things like that. Um, or what are your thoughts about that of, of this issue? Like, do you think they should be held in, in like large animals like that should be held in, in tanks? Yeah. And I mean, I talk a little bit about my experience at the Georgia Aquarium in the article and how it was amazing. I loved seeing them. There's, I can't deny that. There's pictures of me Mm -hmm. smiling wildly in front of them. So I I can't pretend I wasn't happy. Right. But at the same time, it was really sad. They are huge animals. They normally have uh, dominion over, you know, large chunks of ocean. Right. And 6.3 million gallons is a big tank, but it's not necessarily a big surface area. It's a right. lot of volume, but not necessarily a lot of um, horizontal space. Right. Still, still huge for an inland yeah. chunk of water, but like it's a few football fields long, right? Yeah, it's it's just huge. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But again, compared to what they would normally be in, it's quite small. So my, I'm, I'm not sure where I stand on the Georgia Aquarium. It's amazing. It's fun to see everything there. They have such a strong conservation and outreach program. They contribute to natural development in the wild for these species. And right. the, the whale sharks that were brought to the Georgia Aquarium, they would have died in the Taiwanese fishery. They were mm-hmm. uh, Taiwan had a quota for fishing whale sharks when those sharks were caught. And so the aquarium bought them from the fishermen. The fishermen still got money. Right. And um, they were out of the quota. So okay. Those sharks would have died anyway. Um, okay. It's arguable about whether they're happy or not where they are, but yeah, I mean, it, yeah. they're alive. Right, true. And and, and like you said, the, the Georgia Aquarium, and I know this for a fact too, puts on a lot of good programs, a lot of good conservation. So Probably right. one of the best uh, in the U.S., and I guess in North America, maybe even in the world. Uh, and the fact, I mean, yeah, you could argue, like, 
they they bought it off fishermen those those sharks would have died yes um so maybe they did save them in a in a in a broken system sort of thing like they shouldn't have been fished in the first place but in a broken <laughs> system they survived and you know people get to see these sharks and connect with the ocean which is w- the idea of, of aquariums right is to connect with specific species like imagine just looking at these i can just imagine i mean you've seen it like looking at these bees and i think you can actually i've i've been told you can actually pay them some money and go scuba diving or snorkeling in the tank yes you can and yeah. uh, i didn't do that um i'm really hoping to be able to do that in the wild one day but yes uh, yeah <laughs> they yeah you can do that and i think it's a couple of hundred dollars but yeah yeah you can go snorkel with them it's um yeah it's it's just it's such an impressive sight and that's i think that's part of it a lot of people hear about whale sharks, they'll see it online or they'll see a yeah. picture or a video, but there's something to be said about being there. And that's mm-hmm. why I'm not against zoos and aquariums altogether because, for example, there's some frogs in the Toronto Zoo and they're in a breeding program. Their habitat in the Andes has been destroyed. They don't live there anymore or very few of them have been rediscovered. Right. If they weren't in zoos and we weren't doing breeding programs when the habitat's restored, which many conservation groups are trying to do, they'd have none left to, no frogs left to put back. Right. I had never heard of this frog. Right, right. That lots of people haven't. And if you can't go and see this little cute yellow frog, how do you get people interested in donating their time, their resources, uh, spreading the word? So it's really, it's a fine line between the exploitation of the few to help the many. And yeah. I, it just depends on what kind of for-profit system you're working on because if you're all non-profit, obviously that has a lot of value in terms of you know your money's all going to good work, but at the same time, uh, there's a lot of debate about the innovation stagnation with n- non-profit organizations sometimes, and if you're for-profit, you have a lot more drive to have research and promote new products and have a market share, so yeah, there's yeah. a lot of back and forth on if uh, the best mix is actually a little bit of for-profit and a little bit of non-profit, which I right. think a lot of the really good programs are. And I, yep. I do think Georgia Aquarium is one that yes. operates on a both system. I think so, too. I think you're right. And, I mean, it really comes down, I think, you know, I think we can both agree on this. It really comes down to if, if you're going to hold a large animal, you know, whether yeah. it be a marine mammal, polar bear, you know, a whale, an orca, a whale shark, whatever, let it be from to save them in the wild. So if they're going to die in the wild from a fishery or loss of habitat, for sure, you know that for sure, then it's, it's for me, I, I think it makes sense to bring them in. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, but also solve the problem of why, the, you, know, the, the, you, you know, the fishery, try and get rid of the fishery if it's an endangered species or, um, yeah. you know, try and stop the loss of habitat. But if the animal is just the animal and it's surviving well and it's happy in the wild, and there's no danger to it, don't bring it into an aquarium or a zoo, right? That's I definitely agree with that. Yeah. It's, it's hard to convince uh, everyone and maybe even us the, the, the intrinsic value of the species in or their, their value just for existing in their right. own habitat, even right. if we can't see them or appreciate them. And that's I think that's a hard sell. Yeah, I agree. It is a, definitely a hard sell. It's a hard sell. But they do, and they do offer a good value of education when, when yeah. kids and, and parents go and, and everybody goes to these aquariums, right? So it's interesting. Good. Okay. Well, let's get on to the last one because uh, this, this is probably going to go on more than five or ten mi- minutes. And we got another cat on. Sorry. That's okay. No worries. It's fun. It's fun. There's We're all about two. animals here. I swear. There's only two. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, the last one, and, and we've kind of touched upon this, is – are the conservation efforts at aquariums and zoos sufficient for o- overall? Now, we're not just looking at individual programs. Let's look at overall. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you think these conservation programs could be there? Could you think there's more that could be done, or do you think it's just one of those things where it's just there for show, or it's or it's just not enough? Um, kind of a loaded question, I guess. But I guess it depends on. I I'd have to break them down into sort of the the for profit. Um, Putting the animals through, you know, through exhibit exhibitions, I guess, and, sh- and and entertainment. Right. The ones that are just you go and look at them, and then the ones that are completely f- like nonprofit. And I, I think you do have to make a little bit of that distinction because I don't think I could lump marine land in with other other types because they pretty much don't do anything that I could find. And again, I'm I'm not a hundred percent, but in yeah. my little bit of research 
I couldn't really find too much in the way of conservation research. Sure, they do outreach and education on their property for their specific right. animals. Right. But um, even take, for example, the Toronto Zoo, not I, not to bring it back to one particular spot, but they yeah. have an Adopt-a-Pond program that is for the betterment of ponds in the GTA and Ontario. Yeah. So they're taking an interest in, in the area and not really for any particular species, just for frogs and salamanders and anything in the local area that would never be in a zoo. You'd rarely ever see a leopard frog in a zoo. Right, so right. There's a local frog in, in this area, but... So, I'm torn. <laughs> yeah, it, it, and it is. I mean, there's certain programs that are really good and, and certain programs where you're probably like, oh, they could be doing it. Like the Monterey Bay Aquarium, for instance, in California. They do really great research. And, and I think it's more almost like more of an institute with an aquarium. That's what it feels like. And the same thing with, with the Georgia Aquarium. Um, and, and the John Shedd Aquarium um, in Chicago and the New England Aquarium. They do a lot of research. They work with a lot of organizations. They partner and collaborate and do some great work. And and there are some that are just, maybe it's the smaller aquariums. Um, they just don't seem like they do enough. And maybe the, the members of the aquarium should maybe push for that, where they do a little more conservation. Or maybe they're doing the conservation, but they're not telling as many people. They're not communicating in a, in a way, right? So... That could be it too. Maybe there is a whole branch of either Sea World or Marine Land that's just never come out. I mean, I doubt right. it. They probably right. you think want they would. That, yeah, but. you think they would. Um, but even like other aquariums and zoos, um, you know, they should talk about it more. Um, you know, and get it out on their website and things like that. Um, you know, for the ones that don't look like they're doing as much, or maybe just mm -hmm. better their programs, make it strength. And it really, a lot of it comes down to funding and money. Let's let's be honest. Let's not. I'm sure a lot of the people would love to do more research and more conservation, but I think it has to do a lot with that too. So, but this is great. So this is the end of our episode. We're, I'm trying to keep it as short as possible. I don't know how long we've gone. I think we've gone maybe 15 minutes, but that's okay because we got a lot of. You know, this is a, this is a a tough issue to talk about. Even these three, we could probably go on for about 45 minutes each on on each on each issue. But um, this is what Ocean Talk's about. So what I want to do is I don't really want to stop the, like the, the conversation is going to stop between us right now. But what I want to do is I want to continue the conversation with our viewers. If you guys have an opinion on this, if you guys know of a conservation program that you really like at a specific aquarium or zoo, um, put it down in the comments below. Let us know. Put links, things like that. Let's let's get a discussion going. Um, I'll try and answer a lot of the comments. And maybe Rebecca, if she has, if, if she has the time, she can hop on either YouTube or um, or, or the site and just you know check every once in a while and engage in some conversations. And um, let's just keep in mind, guys, that uh, everybody be friendly to each other. If you don't have, if you don't share the same uh, viewpoint, you know that's fine. You can address it, but let's let's be nice to each other. The internet can be uh, a beast sometimes. So anyway. Um, thanks for joining our first program of Ocean Talk. Let us know uh, if you like this, if you like these kind of videos and you want to see more because I'm willing to do more. I really like these kind of things. Um, and you can show your support if you're on YouTube or you want to go over to YouTube. Uh, you can like and subscribe to, to, to the channel and, and like the video, favorite it, share it uh, with your friends. Uh, it'll really help us out to get the message out and get more people discussing. So uh, I'm Andrew Lewin, and I'm here with Rebecca Dolson, co-host. Uh, and we will see you next week with uh, with a new, um, who knows, Rebecca might be here depending on her schedule. She's got knee problems, but we'll, we'll work with that, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about another issue. And again, if you want to talk about certain issues, hashtag Ocean Talk on Twitter. And if you want to be a part of the conversation, let us know with the hashtag Ocean Talk Twitter. Okay? Um, and I guess we'll see you later. Thanks a lot.